This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. All of our podcasts are available from our website, www.sas.ac.uk. Welcome to the London Seminar on Digital Text and Culture. My name is Richard Curry. It's my pleasure to introduce this time Catherine Harris from San Jose State University in California. Um, Catherine's primary interest is in 19th century popular literature, or more exactly, in Romantic era 19th century British literature, women's authorship, literary annual 19th century. And history of the book, textuality, editorial theory, digital humanities, and pedagogy. Just about everything. <laughs> Catherine. Well, good evening. First of all, thank you to Willard and Claire and Melissa for letting them come over here and also for listening from afar on Twitter and on the Humanist Listserv. I, I actually think I started my career because I was listening in on Humanist. Or, or watching what was going on and seeing the fun fights that everybody had and then realizing they all like each other in the end and they would go for beers. And I thought, I want to be part of that community. Uh, I, I got started in uh, textual scholarship and digital editing at the, when I was in graduate school. And I think it's going to be my lifelong job to work on the literary annuals, which is the topic I'm going to talk to you about today, as well as digital editing uh, and how far we're going or how far we're not going. Um, one of the things that's happening with digital humanities is that it's moving very quickly uh, in terms of tools, in terms of these innovations and these really fabulous things that are going on all over the world. And we hear about them because we're all linked through these social networks over Twitter, the listservs, anything else that uh, uh, we can actually watch across any sort of boundaries. And one of the things that I think that happens is also that we go so fast that we forget to take a step backwards. And I'm working on one of these projects that where I, I need a lot of uh, labor at the base level and not simply at the bigger level. I'd love to be able to do network analysis on some of the work, on some of the text that I've got, but I can't do it because we don't have a full corpus yet. So I wanted to talk to you a little bit about walking backwards a little bit in terms of digital humanities and digital scholarly editing, but at the same time going forward. So it's sort of a matrix move, of going forward, backward, and standing still at the same time. Um, and I, I want to start with just a few things. There's, there's so much kerfuffle going on right now about digital humanities and, and what it means and what it's doing, uh, and especially at the institutional level, that I'm really pulled backwards by my institution, not by digital humanities, and not by the institution at large, um, the, or, or academia at large. My department wants a print text. And I just got tenure last year, and I did it without giving them a print text of the digital edition. Um, I bullied and armed my way through and just said, you're not going to get it, it's just going to stay that way. But I have another collection that I, I just got word from the publisher today that they're not going to be able to put it out on time. And I'd like to go up for another promotion. And, they, and my department said, we need a print text in order to do the promotion. So I was, I was thinking on the train over here ways that you guys could possibly help me with strong arming my department into sort of having a pseudo print text, but really having a digital, another digital archive. So, talk a little bit about that too. Uh, these are four things um, from the ACLS report way back in 2006. We've come a long way since then. Cy they, it's a report that was talking about cyber infrastructure for the humanities and social sciences. It talks about, number one, building a digital collection of information for further study and analysis, creating appropriate tools for collection building, creating appropriate tools for analysis and study of these collections, creating authoring tools for these new intellectual products, and then number five, using digital collections and analytical tools to generate new intellectual products. We've gotten really far on this list from the ACLS, but number five, I think, is also where we've stymied just a little bit. Uh, I have to admit that I've been working on this digital project, the Forget Me Nots, for the last 10 years. 10 years, and it's nowhere near done. We need more money and more time. Uh, and we also just need bodies typing things in. So I think that's where we really get hung up on, on number five. When I say we, I mean digital humanities as a whole and digital editing. Um, I'm very aware of the fact that Claire just gave an inaugural lecture that said stop doing lectures <laughs> as I was printing this out and I thought there's no way. You know, I'll, I'm so passionate about the literary animals that uh, I would just sit here and tell you stories about the more lascivious things that went on rather than getting to the task at hand. So I'm going to just 
stay on point, read a little bit to you, and then uh, we'll get to them talking about how, and I'd like to get your input on how we can realign some of this idea of the digital scholarly edition. Uh, well, and some of my questions for today include uh, digital editions provided access to literature that wouldn't normally be accepted but for publication by a reputable university press. And therefore, with this online publication, have we widened the literary canon even further, especially the British literary canon? Or are digital editions just as marginalized as some of the literature that these editions represent? Um, some further cogent questions, how can we set aside long-standing aesthetic biases against an author, literary genre, or popular form with a new type of scholarly edition? What more supple vocabulary can we use to describe the complexities of editorial work while incorporating new strategies for crowdsourcing, visualization, and network analysis? And are digital projects epidemic or preserving what was really intended to be ephemeral? Well, I throw that out as a sort of a political question. My response to that is nothing is ephemeral, but we have to choose something. Uh, this talk is really a culmination of my thoughts uh, on being an archivist, a scholarly editor, a digital archivist, a digital humanist, and a specialist in a particularly early 19th century British literary genre, the literary annual. Uh, I began this work because the fields were exciting, all of them, quite frankly, when I way back a long time ago when I was a grad student, because they seemed to be on the fringes of traditional literary study of that 10 years ago. Many of these areas are accused of being methodologies instead of theory, practice instead of analysis, and for the literary genre, inconsequential instead of canonical, which is the thing that annoys me the most. I'm still going to conferences explaining what is a literary annual, and above and beyond that, I always get the question, the so what? Why should we even care about this? Um, what began as a fluke being buried in these archives, which is one and, and the scholarly ones, very quickly became a happy career-generating accident, and the digital humanities community was no small part of that happy accident. At the outset of my graduate work, I already knew that my dissertation would focus on the literary genre. And the genre would straddle the British and Romantic Victorian eras. So in, in the American system, I was already uh, really being somebody who was a rabble rouser because I refused to pick if I was going to be Romantic or Victorian as a literary scholar. The genre, though, was a messy heap of multiple authors, literary genres, editors, publishers, painters, and engravers, in addition to a multiplicity of sizes, bindings, and papers. Uh, when I began working on the annuals, my queries were rooted in traditional humanistic inquiry. And this is the question that digital humanities is getting a lot now. What are you doing besides counting things? And there's the whole theory that counting is theory. Um, but my response to that is, well, we're doing a lot of stuff with the numbers, and I'll get to some of those in a minute. Um, the other questions are, why wasn't a comprehensive and continuing history of the literary annual actually created by anyone when I was in grad school? Why did the existing history seem divided on the genre's importance, and most of them citing commentary by 19th century by two reviewers, especially if you look here at the retail prices of reading materials? Literary annuals fall at 12 shillings to 3 pounds, so it was more, a much higher price than the price for the upper middle classes, so why weren't you paying attention to it? The primary impediment for offering such a literary history of the annuals, at least in 2001, was that no scholar had been able to assess the entire genre due to a lack of access. When I say the entire genre, I'm talking about 1823 and 1861. There, in, in England alone, there were 3,000 volumes published. Of the more popular ones, we're talking somewhere upwards of 400, 450. Nobody has access to them because nobody collects them in a single library, except maybe the British Library, the University of South Carolina, my collection that I built up because I had to, and Paula Feldman, Paula Feldman's private collection. Uh, the literary annuals were eventually deemed inconsequential by reviewers in the 19th century. Uh, the 20th century critics took them at their word, as did special collections curators and archivists. And they would deaccession the uh, literary annuals when they needed room for something more important. So you'd be hard pressed to find a continuous run of, say, the Forget Me Not, which was the original one, uh, across all 25 years, let alone in its original paper bindings. Scholars instead had implemented case studies, typically of only one or two volumes, or entered into the conversation through a single canonical author. Um, However, other than the initial studies in the 1920s and later feminist recovery efforts in the 1970s and 1980s, most scholars had ignored the physical object itself. 
the gorgeous gilt edge silk wrapped bindings in duodecimo, uh, and they would fit into, they were originally duodecimo, so they could fit into the pocket of a woman's skirt, and she'd carry them to the newly formed parks in urban environments. Right. That's a little bit apocryphal, but I'd like to believe, though, because I think it's uh, charming. By ignoring this materiality, scholars erase the book history facet of literary annuals, and this is where I thought I would rectify the situation, uh, at least for my graduate work in the field. And the, but the issue of literary annuals is twofold. To create a valid literary history of an, uh, an entire genre that spans 40 years is folly, at the very least, um, at the most, it's an entire career. Number two was needed to figure out how to provide a platform and tools and a venue for access to these material objects and its, its contents. But I want to begin with the literary annuals first. I've been working on this archival project um, just really in the first few decades of the 19th century um, and inspired by inter intercontinental literary forms and created by a successful art publisher, Rudolf Ackerman, the annual first appeared in London in 1822 and was claimed by a myriad of publishers to represent the best of British ingenuity, even though material, the material form, the printing process, and the editorial methods were really borrowed from French and German pocketbooks, albums, and envelopes. Originally, literary annuals were to replace the conduct books of the late 18th century, but the editors and publishers' claims don't really match that intention. In my larger work, I argue this first thing. And I always chop this out because I love this idea of the materiality of the text. Um, the British, literary, British 19th century literary annual and its textual production is best seen as a female body. Its male producers struggling to make it both proper and sexually alluring. Its female authors and readers attempting to render it their own feminine ideal. At first, reviewers really enjoyed the annuals, offering long excerpts and recommending particular annuals to their readers. Within five years, though, reviewers began to write with disgust about the genre, primarily with objections to the poetess uh, aesthetic. Laura Mandel, uh, actually, Laura wrote this for one of our many, many grant applications to the NEH that never got funded, and it was such a beautiful turn of phrase that we could never figure out a, a, a where to put it. Uh, she points out that two myths pervade the study of this immensely important and influential body of writing. One is that canonical writers shun this work, refusing to publish in well-paying annuals, and choosing instead to create great high art. The other is that poetry's poetry is bad writing. Um, both myths rely on the production of aesthetics, and it was the reviewers who produced this demarcation about annuals. At first, praising as possessing a tone of romance, which set off as it did by poetry of the uh, of a very high order, and they can have no other possible tendency than to purify the imagination and the heart. Lest we become mired wholly in the aesthetic perception of the annuals, just contents, it's important to note the materiality and the genesis of this particular genre in order to understand its eventual trashing and imminent resurrection. These are going to come out a little bit dark. Uh, some of the other bindings I have to show you are glorious to look at, so if you can't quite see them there, I'll move turn around my computer and just show it to you there. Um, published in the German magazine The Free Speaker in 1815, the novel Mimoli sold unprecedented, an unprecedented 9,000 copies in three years and inspired genre of sentimental prose that capped the German Enlightenment. And based on the success of Mimoli, the author H. Corin began publishing an annual publication, this one, Lucas My Night, translated as Forget Me Not and named after the flower given to the young man by Mimoli. In November 1822, Rudolf Ackermann, a German immigrant and very successful lithography and periodical publisher, borrowed and translated this German form and title for the first literary annual, The Forget-Me-Not. He and his editor, Frederick Schrubel, then decided to translate and abbreviate Clorin's Mimoli into the chaste engraving here, but they retained the almost pornographic, at least for the early 19th century, descriptions of Mimoli's heaving bosoms and exposed anger. Yeah, he's telling the story. It's incredible, too. Uh, though Ackerman admitted to borrowing from the German and French predecessors, he immediately differentiated his literary annual as a representation of British printing ingenuity. However, Ackerman is not acknowledged uh, now to be the father of literary annuals. By wrapping beauty, literature, landscape, art, and portraits into an alluring Package for 12 shillings, editors and publishers filled the 1820s with this popular and best selling genre. They're originally published in paper boards, 
the annuals were usually whisked away to be rebound in beautiful leather covers. And what you're not seeing here is that that's a beautiful, decadent, light green leather cover with gilded impressions all the way around. And this was a family's binding. I managed to find quite a few in this, this exact same binding. So my next step will be to figure out who all the binders are and so I can locate them. But again, that's step number 463 in this, this project. Uh, by 1828, publishers employed the latest innovations in binding and switched to silk to amplify the value of material objects, and so that's red more silk. Each annual typically offered a confined space for dedication. And this is, this is actually raised, so when you run your fingers over it, you can feel all of the, uh, the flowers themselves. Early annuals offered practical information similar to the Stationers Company Almanac, but that would soon disappear in favor of more literary and visual content. Though Ackerman, I just discovered, was very business savvy. He decided to release his first literary annual, the Forget-Me-Not, on Almanac Day. And nobody's really made this association, so he, he, really, he knew exactly what it is he was doing. Early annuals, um, uh, they included engravings which were then cast from popular paintings but rarely garnered any fame for the engraver who was deemed a mere copyist and denied entrance into the Royal Academy. You can't see this one either. So the original painting at the top gets recast in, uh, as an engraving. The engraver also took, uh, and still played engravings, uh, also took a lot of liberties with revising it. In this particular pair, we have, we have fewer uh, religious iconography in the engraving than we do. Often engravings were commissioned like this one. I love this one because my, my first thought is, why don't you let your baby get to the edge of the cliff? <laughs> and then well-known poets were asked to render an accompanying poem, work for hire, eventually much to the poet's dismay. But let me stress something here. Every single canonical author who we study in the Romantic and the Victorian period now published in the literary annual, some too great well. Um, Sir Walter Scott, of course, was the famous, he was offered 500 pounds to edit a literary annual. He said no, so he graciously received 150 pounds for a two-page poem. A little uneven. Felicia Hammonds, I bet, didn't, wasn't given that much money for this particular one. Uh, eventually, one annual circumvented the autograph album and included a pull-out page complete with famous authors' autographs already included. Uh, this is from the literary souvenir, and when I first, this is from my collection, when I first got it as a very young graduate student, I pulled out that page in the back and I thought, graduate school is paid for. This is incredible. <laughs> no, no, it goes further. So then I posted to the uh, Nasser listserv uh, with all the romanticists on there and said, this is what I found, and here's an image of it, and everybody, all the senior scholars very graciously emailed me back and said, you're in New York, why don't you go to the New York Public Library and double check? I think these are not original, so, you know, I felt like a little dog being on the top of the head. <laughs> it was incredible. <laughs> uh, with a large audience uh, almost immediately clamoring for more literary annuals, Ackerman and his editor, Sherwell, created a second Forget-Me-Not for 1824 and found themselves competing with friendships offering new graces. By 1828, 15 English literary annual titles had joined the market to only to buy for an audience against 30 more titles by 1830. The trade in annuals had become so popular that various titles emerged with hopes and promises of continuing and really publication. But with titles like The Olive Branch and Zoological Keepsake, which I've never been able to find, nobody has it anywhere, uh, appearing and vanishing in a single year, more often than not that promise was broken. Many factors led to the success or demise of a particular title, external appearance, engraving quality, literary contents, popular authors, editorial arrangement, marketing, and reviews. And this last element provided an introduction of public face to each annual by recommending, denouncing, or simply excerpting those contents. Even with all this popular success, the critical condescension surrounding the annual would haunt the genre well into the 19th century. This is a favorite, too, because it calls the annuals the cakes of literature. Not the bread, the cakes of literature. Just a little tasty delight. In the middle of the day, nothing substantial at all. After finally sputtering out in England in 1857, the annual reappeared in, in an homage to Rudolf Ackerman during the 1930s. And this was uh, uh, 
Vita Sackbell West was involved with this, uh, uh, as, as well as quite a few other luminaries in, in, in paying attention to the way Ackerman actually put together the original annual, and then they borrowed most of the format from it. Even Charles Talent Bateman condescendingly recommends annuals and poetry's poetry, uh, as the case of the which you saw earlier. An example D of the rationale of hypertext, and this is moving on to why it, this needs to be turned into a digital archive, McGann provides a new way of seeing a 19th century British poet in a form of vocation. He contrasts Letitia Elizabeth Landon's poetry with that of Wordsworth and Tennyson's by pointing to the relationship between Landon's poetry and the images that she often composed verses for. McGann points out that Landon's poetry was tied not only to the image, but also to the literary annual itself. And this is a quote from McGann. As we know, serious people long ago stopped reading writers like Landon and Felicia Hemmons. But their work will become difficult to understand if we don't receive it in the forms that at least approximate its original imaginative condition. In Landon's case, the pictorial and ornamental context of the gift book product can be torn away from her work only at the cost of its destruction. So, and therefore, Landon's work is a perfect candidate for what he then called, now this is 1997, he called a hypermedia edition, and we're calling it something now. Martha Nell Smith takes this further to assert that the Dickinson Electronic Archive provides a view of, quote, how process is inextricably a part of the product, how her, referring to Emily Dickinson, manuscripts show that she was not bound by print-determined distinctions between poetry and prose, and best of all, the technology allows the readers to draw different conclusions based on their first-hand experiences. And this is also something also that Julia Flanders discusses in detail as of digital text and the problem of pedantry. But this is also, in fact, less an editorial hand with the, a digital archive of this nature, and more a sociology of the text, as Dean McKenzie would call it. <coughs> like the Dickinson Archive, McGann's proposal for Landon is, often, is, is also a feminist project because as uh, Smith writes, it provides access to histories and literatures long buried by the biases of traditional scholarship, end quote. This reasoning has been the major impetus for some digital scholarly projects. Access, especially for the women, and seeing what it is that they were writing. And by the way, when I read McGann for my qualifying exams, and I read that example D um, in his work, I thought he was speaking directly to me, and so I took up the mantle and said, I'll do it. I'll save the little books. That's foolish, right? In a way, uh, this, is, this is all that I've been doing for the last 10 years and everything is an offshoot from it. I've been converting the literary annuals into a digital representation that tries to closely approximate the original form and original experience. No access to the annuals and their distinctive wrappings and without any contextualization will, I fear, bring all the continued smears of literary speeds. When I, I'd love to put in smell too. Haven't we? Don't we have an app for that yet? The <laughs> smell of the books. You can smell the mold, feel the paper. When I discovered these volumes in libraries scattered around New York City, and subsequently began building my own collection, my dissertation soon became a defense of the annual's authority, validity, and place in British Romantic and Victorian literature. Critical analysis of the writings and engravings within were relegated to the last chapters, the last chapters seven through ten of my dissertation while I struggled to formulate a coherent and comprehensive literary history of the early annuals. Even in using my fast-growing collection, I found it unrealistic to keep track of the connections across various volumes, titles, and decades. And my poor roommate, I took over our living room and put the, the little um, beaded library snakes all over all of the annuals that I could open so I could see and compare. Now, it's through a decimo, so the engravings were a little smaller, talking like this, back when I didn't have to wear glasses. So I would have 20 open on the living room floor and trying to compare across them engravers' um, bindings if it was uh, um, tipped in with India paper and the engravings or if they all had gilded edges because I couldn't keep track of them just looking at them uh, on the shelf itself. So some, a graduate student that David Greedham had been working with and had already graduated came in and showed us this cool digital edition that she did. And David said, why don't you do this as just a chapter of your dissertation? So I created the Hypertextual Archive. Um, and we loosely call it an edition, but I'm pretty severe about saying that it's an archive and we're shifting those kinds of words these days. Uh, and David told me, yeah, go ahead and do it, but you're still going to have to write because the rest of your committee is going to want to see literary criticism 
when I wanted to write literary history and not literary criticism. I felt like we needed a foundation before we could actually go in and do that much literary criticism of, of what was written inside the annuals. So this is the part where I, I was going to give you a tour, but you guys can Google this later and find it. Uh, it's part of the Poetess Archive. Laura Mandel um, knocked on my virtual door my last year in graduate school and said, I'd like to incorporate all your metadata. And I said, who are you and what do you want? What's metadata? <laughs> and from then, Laura started schooling me what it is that we need to do in, in terms of creating these digital editions and these digital archives, looking at Digital Library Federation standards for scanning, which I tried to keep up with. And we created a workflow for adding more to the Forget Me Not archive. Now, the archive itself is created in frames. Let me go back for a second. It was originally created in frames and done with front page. I'm sorry. That's all I have to say to everybody in the room. Um, after entering the archive, what you get on one side is a primary index of everything you have access to. I was able to provide the full uh, text to only one annual. There are 300 pages per annual, and at that time I was using a flatbed scanner, and so I was cracking this the binding, but yeah, exactly, um, of these paper covered um, literary annuals, and at some point I had to stop. Uh, so I decided I would just focus on the Forget Me Not because I felt like it was the primary literary annual. So what I also had to do in order to, when I decided to go live, was to create a list of prominent contributors to all literary annuals in order to interest everybody so they wouldn't just look at it and say, well, this is another pretty little thing that you self-published, so why don't you tell us why it's important? And when I discovered this after going to several conferences, that you needed to have an association with all of the 19th century, the Romantic period, that's when my head sort of exploded and my dissertation went to 10 chapters instead of just three or four, as, as was usual with everybody else. Uh, and, and also with the, the Forget Me Not archive, when you go into it, you get all of the engravings and the bindings scanned. You get every single one of the uh, authors who was published in the Forget Me Not, it's just hyperlinked. Now the, the Forget Me Not archive has some failures, it's not searchable, it's not TEI encoded, it's in frames. Uh, we, there was a point where we, Laura and I decided that it was too garbled to, to fix it that we couldn't go back and TEI and code everything, because I was doing things like transcribing letters and correspondence and setting up these links to things to explain the literary annuals, but also all of the publishers and, and the authors or reviews, I would also transcribe them and put them into the Forget Me Not archive. It's so complex, it's an addition. And so the Poetess Archive database, where we started putting in all of the original text and all of the criticism, dispersed everything. So you couldn't call up and see, uh, really, and compare all of the forget-me-nots. It just is not possible because it's a database. It's not a scholarly edition in the Poetess Archive database. So I think this is one of the things that I, I struggle with now when we're going to digital humanities, is that we have all of these digital archives and digital editions, and we have the big ones that, that acknowledge the uh, with, by the MLA and given awards now and sort of across humanities, the Blake Archive, the Whitman Archive gets a, a whole lot uh, of, uh, of, of just attention, but they also have libraries and centers backing them. And here I, I am now just really a sole person, a sole editor working on the Forget Me Not Archive. When we pushed it over to the Poetess Archive, we decided to leave this up, but then move all of our uh, data, all, all of our transcripts over to the Poetess Archive so that the, the forget-me-not and any other literary annual we happen to transcribe and scan would also be searchable across all 19th century literature that's also in the Poetess Archive, both British and American. And the Poetess Archive is part of nine, so you can search across not just those, but all of those. And that's the idea behind doing these, these digital archives, is that you have some interoperability. So we came up with this workflow, which was great. It was fantastic to be able to finally articulate the way in which this needs to be put together. And I worked at, as an archivist uh, at Fales Library in New York University. And they sent me into um, a room and said, OK, pick the things that you want to catalog, because we were sort of backlog. I walked in, and it was a ream of uncatalogued things. And so I went in and started picking out the literary, literary annuals that were scattered everywhere. And from that, I started figuring out what it is to do history of the book, but also textual studies with the help of, of Morgan Taylor. And then also from there, they introduced me to the digital library standards and, and scanning what it is that we need to do. So I didn't start doing the Forget Me Not Archive in just scanning and throwing things up there. There was a strategy to uh, the way I was structuring it, the architecture of it. 
And it was when Laura came along that I realized that there are other people who were doing this who were much more experienced than I was. So the, the, it, we started out, this is officially seven years ago when I got the job at San Jose State. I created all of this. We work off a MacBook Pro. We have the external hard drive for backing it up. We have the Optic Book 3600 scanner, which the only thing that it does, the platen goes all the way to the edge so you can have a book at a 90 degree angle. That's it. And it's at home now. It was in my office, but it's at home. So that's my center for the Forget Me Not Archive, was my office. Uh, our library has now acquired a, um, a, a camera scanner, and because I'm good friends and do triathlons with the special collections director, I can go in and use it anytime that I want. Just, you know, I have to let her beat me when we do runs and stuff like that. So there's a, there's a trade off. Um, we back up our data to external hard drives. Me, I mean. Um, the images are 600 dpi using the tabletop book scanner and saved as a raw uh, TIFF, so you can get both the JPEG and the TIFF. Uh, we, we, we're keeping records in a database uh, of the workflow. We were also keeping records about what was being transcribed and sent over to Laura at the Poetess Archive. And then she would also have graduate students working on converting them into TEI and XML. That's since stopped Laura's moved over to Texas A&M Texas is running a center now, so we'll pick that up in a little bit. The Forget Me Not site, we intended fully to add more images and transcriptions to the current HTML site, but when we started advancing in innovation so quickly with the digital studies and digital tools, we had to take a step back and really ask ourselves if we wanted to um, let the Forget Me Not archive just do great as it was. It's, it's being used by people, so we didn't want to let go of it. Well, the HTML frames dependent, no CSS or search, and the data is organized by myself. So we moved it over. This is what we did. We moved it over into the Poetess Archive. And this is the way that it's structured here. There's a collection that's searchable. There's criticism with some full text that's searchable. The literary annuals are within it. Collections are within it with bibliographic entries, some full text. Uh, we have the 19th century primary text, some 20th century criticism, and some really contemporary 21st century criticism that we're, we're actually asking people to contribute. We have individual works as TEI and XML objects, but when you call it up, what you get is the TEI. You just get the text, that content. You don't get it as the page scans, so you can select the page scans. One of the things that Laura and I had originally worked on was trying to figure out if we could do one of those turning the pages 3D book kind of things. We could turn around and see the um, see the object itself and turn the pages, see the weight of the paper, zoom into it. And that was just going to be so costly and, and we came so close to getting an NEH um, grant to do that that after we didn't, we just decided we needed to take a step back and see what else was going to be invented. And now we've got visualization and a, tools like Monk and Juxta that can go through and start to do some semantic searching as well. And so now we have to start talking about do we want to tag all of the engravings. So the list becomes longer and longer the more we think about these big humanistic inquiries to this very, very large corpus that nobody has really paid attention to, except me and any graduate student or undergraduate student I can pull in. We have two what we're calling editions in the Poetess Archive. Laura created the Bijou for 1828, full text with engravings, and then we have the Forget Me Not Archive, 1823 to 1830, with only very little um, full text. Uh, the Poetess Archive is part of nines, so we have some serious integration. There you have 950,999 uh, objects in the nines catalogs of every, and I think it's probably hit a million by now. But there's some failure that's going on here, too. Let me just skip that part, okay. Um, so this is where small digital projects fail, where they stall in key areas. Acquisition of the raw data. Who's going to scan it? I have the collection. I'm ready and willing to do it. Uh, who's going to do the scanning of 300 pages, each book, not, not including everything else? Um, if somebody would like to buy me out of all four of my classes, I'll happily do it. But <laughs> that's not going to happen anytime soon. We have a problem over here, down here in red. This is the transfer into TEI and XML. Again, it's very labor intensive. Who's going to do that? Uh, we have the Forget Me Not site. How are we going to maintain that? And in fact, Nines is about to tell me to stop saying that the Forget Me Not digital archive is part of Nines because it's not really part of Nines. 
It's just sort of an option. It's been sitting there for a few years, and it's, because it's not DEI encoded, we have a problem with it. And then finally, the bottom part is the HTML design frames dependent. But the biggest thing is there, there's no search, unless I did a Google search across each of the frames and tens of pages. So we have a failure there. We have something up, which is better than nothing, but we have a failure because we haven't been able to really integrate all of those tools that we uh, engaged with. But my, my whole philosophy about digital humanities and digital editing is that Productive, fa failure is productive, and this is John Unsworth's big thing, that we, wherever we fail, we're always learning something, we've always advanced something. And the second one is a, an article published at Never Done in the Digital Humanities Quarterly from 2H, 2009, and this is what I had to keep telling my tenure and promotion colleagues over and over again. It's a project that's up and available and people use it, and they said, but when's it going to be done? I said, never, ever. We keep adding stuff that we want to do to it. And they said, well, you've promised to put in full text of 25 volumes in three years. When is that going to be done? And my response was, I, I don't know. Uh, I would like it to be done now, but there's just not enough time in the day in order to be able to do that kind of thing. So I wanted to show you, a, a, I, I got, first of all, I got tired of my own collection being resident only in my house and my study shut up in, in an archival bookcase or archive quality bookcase. So this past semester, I, uh, in the fall, I taught a class called Romanticism and Taste, and students looked at all aspects of taste, aesthetic taste, um, visual taste, verbal taste, um, and, and also gustatory taste. And I invited them over to my apartment, made them dinner, and then spread out only half of my collection on my coffee table, and I said, look at it, what do you think? We stood around for about 15 minutes in that way that graduate students do, uh, and they said, we don't want to know if we can touch the books because they're so old, and they look pretty, and we don't want to hurt them. Uh, and, my, and I just kept thinking in my head, that there are graduate students who want to, who are writing fellowship grants for travel money to come to my apartment to study the collection, and, it, and they won't get those grants because it's not a public collection, and the NEH wouldn't give us money because it's not a public collection, so in order to, to get these digitized, I have to get rid of them and give them to somebody else, to another library, to, to, which I'm not, I'm not against, but that, that's the result of it. So you can kind of see it here, but this is, I, I own somewhere upwards of 300 literary annuals, British, non-American, I stayed away from the American ones, uh, and also the precursors, the envelopes and the almanacs that go with it. So the, what, what we actually ended up doing was trying to dive into them using the forget me Not archive and the Poetics archive and looking things up. Um, let me, go back. Let me go back for a second. Uh, what we really need to do with the literary annuals is count. Just really basically, first and foremost, is we just need to count. I don't care what my colleagues say, we just need to count. Count the number of poems in each volume, the number of pages allotted to each story, um, the number of portrait versus landscape engravings, the repetition of important words and concepts such as virtue or botanical identification. Women were sent outside to go bear flowers. The editorializing annotations appended to some of the literature, the male and female authors, but we can't do that because we've only digitized uh, and marked up maybe 20 or 25 volumes out of the 300. Um, when my graduate students got hold of all of these things, they found some pretty interesting stuff. One student found a very unflattering engraving of Byron, which dashed all of their hopes and thoughts about his attractiveness. This went on for like 10 or 15 minutes. Uh, others found references to Shakespeare within a se severely truncated playbook of Romantic era productions. Yet others found silly poetry and insipid engravings. And there's some bad poetry in there. Epitaph on a gnat crushed in a lady's album. It's not a good poem. It's really not. It's interesting, but it's not a good poem. What could we do with the access to these materials, both the printed word and the bibliographic codes, to allow for semantic searching of the images across all of these other proje projects ranging from the 15th century to the 20th century would be incredible. Um, the literary annual genre resonated with earlier and later versions as well as its impact on the short story genre. It's a type of book that's just begging to be digitized, but isn't. Failure for me in this context, and I do uh, happily wear the badge of being a failed digital scholarly editor of an archive, uh, is more important that, to think about it as a curator, an archivist, or as an editor, it, it's more important to think about it as being productive. And I would add to that very playful. When I ask my students to be playful with this collection of books, um, I ask them to recognize that this is a long research project, project that they are seeing maybe halfway into in my career. 
The forget-me-not-archive has been used, but evidence of its use comes from syllabi, instructions, or listings in prominent lists of resources. Um, they are held at the University of Toronto, South Carolina, New York Public Library, and Paula Feldman also owns a significant um, collection of them, so she and I are trying to figure out where we're going to station these, where somebody will digitize them for us, and then we can run from there. Okay. Um, well, I've written a literary history of the literary annuals, and it's with the publishers now, but I've also moved on to doing something that's much more interesting. I transcribed the Gothic short stories from literary annals from 1823 to 1831 to try to figure out why, the, if, if number one, the forget me not was a leader in the annuals by employing all of these primary um, genres within them in order to make them much more popular, and number two, if this altered the short story um, genre, and number three, if this altered Gothic and Gothic short stories, or, or just Gothic literature in general. We transcribed 100 stories that ended up as 700 typed pages and were published in two volumes in print, unfortunately. Um, it, unless the publisher doesn't come through in the next uh, month or two about the stuff that we need to do with it. But what I found when I, when I moved everything, what I found is that I was keeping track of all the numbers and, and keeping track with one of my research assistants on Google Docs. And I asked her to input things like weird ghosts or maiden or flaming hair. There's a lot of women burning hair in Gothic short stories. Um, or if it, was, if it happened in England or if it happened on some other continent in some other way. And what we started to find was really interesting. And the results actually ended up just some very easy results um, created from Google's Fusion tool, where if you're just putting things into a database, you can start to see and answer the question, was the forget-me-not the most prominent of all literary annuals? Um, and if we're looking at it just from how many Gothic short stories they published, they published probably 75% more pages of Gothic short stories from 1823 to 1831, more than the Keepsake did, which was the most popular one, more than the Friendship's Offering, Literary Souvenir. And, but yet we still don't study the forget-me-not, and it's because we don't have this sense of access. So the other thing that I don't get to show you is um, that with these fusion tables, it's animated that Google created. And so we actually get to see it play out across 1823 to 1831, and how and we watch charts rise and fall. I know that's an inadequate way, but if you uh, just Google Tri Prof Tri, I think I have a blog post on it, it will link you to it, and, and uh, you can take a look at those itself. But an answer to the question for me was the Forget Me Not, the primary source of popular literature of all the literary annuals in that, in that time span. And my response was yes, it was. And it was so nice to be right for a change and have the numbers to back it up. The other questions about semantics are something that we haven't been able to do yet because we're just getting into that network theory and that network analysis that I'd like to start doing it. Start looking at metaphor and tone, and we can do it with these Gothic short stories because they're transcribed. Um, just a note about the, these charts and the tallies and the percentages, because we haven't been able to produce that biological database of the British literary annuals, we aren't able to go beyond what I've transcribed in terms of just those Gothic short stories themselves. Um, and that's, that was two years of opening and closing those books and trying to determine what was Gothic and what wasn't, and reading every single short story in the annuals from 1823 to 1831. Uh, and again, not everything is great. Some of it, the short story was just being developed at this particular time. So a lot of the annual, the short stories would go on great for 18 pages in the last paragraph. Everybody would die or get married. And that would be the end because they had a word count to um, subscribe to with, with the editors as well. Uh, if I could just get all of my personal collection digitized without destroying them, um, meaning leaving the digital representations intact instead of segregated on the screen. Um, the dynamic edition is the thing that actually offers the most success, I think, for, the, for this kind of project. If we could crowdsource and we could collaborate a little bit better, but this means moving around the institution, at least in, uh, in the American version of tenure and promotion. My colleagues want that print version. They want to see what it is that I can produce and then we can sell and we can use in the classroom. But that's not what I want to do. I want to put the, trans the TEI transcripts out there. I want to have the 3D version of it. And I want to be able to crowdsource information from art historians to scientists to tell me why there was so much botanics in, uh, in the literary annuals. So, that, so what, it is, what is it that we call it now? A digital archive, a digital edition? Do we call it an arsenal? Um, 
based on what I think uh, uh, Ken Price, very tongue-in-cheek, said that we should call digital editions now? Or do we just leave them alone and just get to work and stop trying to theorize everything? I vote for that we get to work, but that we also change the language, but that we then we go back to work and we continue building so that we can get to the more fun stuff of, of theorizing what's the value of literary. So I'll stop there. And I invite you to go and look at the stuff online because it's got all the groovy things in it. Thank you very much. <laughs> Let me start out with a couple of questions. Um, what is it you describe a slippery slope? Very Which one? Yeah. The story of your life um, <laughs> can be seen as a slippery slope, which heads almost, seems to head almost inexorably toward a kind of industrialization of scholarship. Large scale projects which require grants and graduate students and a modern typing pool, in other words. With, um, a loss of or a postponement of scholarship is something that gets done sometime in the future when all of this marvelous vision can be, can be lived. And the, the fact that, that your um, work sits on the periphery of minds and is about to be ejected as an unwanted child. And, and uh, Jerry McGann is a very generous heart and soul. And so I, it, it's hard to imagine that he would eject anything. But this, this big industrial sized project, which doesn't want you because you're not TBI encoded, um, is based, it's, its rectitude is based on the assumption that TBI will endure forever. And that's not true. We know that's not true. TBI is normal. If, when TBI starts to rot and die, then what's going to happen to this big industrial structure? That's the first question. The second question is, hey man, um, down. <laughs> a lot of, uh, most projects are essentially fitting the literature to the technology. Here's the kit that we have, the hardware we have, and so on and so on and so on. So we do these marvelous things with it. I don't see much evidence of thinking from the literature, from the book history, to the technology, to the technological possible. Not the technological actual, but there, there's a there's a one-way traffic, and I'm wondering if, what kind of a thing could you imagine if you start with the annual as an object that you want to carry over into the digital medium and have the medium conform to the fullness of its reality. How could you imagine that? Well, the, my, my dreamscape is to uh, have a digital archive arsenal, whatever it is. <laughs> Maybe the answer will get better here. Yeah, that's a little bit better. That it would open up with that 3D version of the literary annual so you could see it approximate some sort of reading experience because it was such a small volume, it was meant to be held in your hand yeah. and have somebody sit next to you with it. So as you're looking at it, you won't necessarily be the 19th century woman taking a look at it, but you'll actually start to ask some questions. How does this impact the, the people who were uh, expected to buy it? And my, my response to all digital archives is that they're an approximation of the material object. You would look at my archive, and then you would go find one in the library. Thank you. You can also go find one. <laughs> um, we, we have now three-dimensional copy machines. Mm -hmm. Copy machines that will reproduce three-dimensional objects with working parts. And it's only a matter of time until we have uh, holographic, three-dimensional holographic projectors. I mean, they, they're prototypes now. They're very clunky and clumsy and hugely expensive, but we will have little boxes that throw up a three-dimensional image that we can look around. So this is within grasp, but you're Right. But it's and it's been around for a really long time. I was at a meeting for Project Bamboo when they started doing all that stuff a long time ago, and I was sitting with somebody from archaeology uh, from a Berkeley department, and I was describing this project to him and what I would like to be able to do. And by the way, I live in Silicon Valley. We are literally down the street from Adobe, but we get no money from them. And, and, and Google is down the street, and Stanford is right down the street and doing some cool things with the Lit Lab. 
But when I described to this person from archaeology that I wanted this 3D version, he said, oh, we already do that. We do that at sites. Don't you guys talk to you know, you want to come up and use They have those cameras yes. that go around and yeah. Yes. So it, it was what um, someone once said to me was the pump phenomenon. The technology is out there, but how do I know where it's available and where I can actually get these done? So it's not the dreaming of the project. I do agree with you that we're trying to fit this kind of digital project into the platforms that are ready-made and available, like maybe using Omeka. Which like is frames. <laughs> All the range. <laughs> I think it was. <laughs> are there, I wonder if there are people in the room who don't know what frames are. Probably. <laughs> there are, yes. Yeah. yeah. Is, anybody, is there any website in frames anymore? Oh, yeah. I've seen a couple of English department websites. Oh, <laughs> frames. Funny. Yeah. But I think that but the tools that are being created would help us. For instance, if we tag everything and say, well, we, could, we have identified what is the poetess aesthetic. It's a certain meter, it's a certain way of using tone and metaphor and poetry. But what if we could run that as a network analysis across all of the literary annuals to see who really was engaged in writing this poetess aesthetic? It's Tennyson is in there, Wordsworth is in there, but we know this only because it's the pub phenomenon. We happen to open up a literary annual and take a look at it. And I, and it's that same thing. We find out what the technology is and, and what it's doing only by having a conversation with somebody. But that doesn't mean you're going to have access to it. And because I constantly am having to go back and explain the value of literary annuals and that there are canonical authors in there, I'm having to sell it to academia as containing all of these canonical people. So we, we have, there are a lot of areas that we have to deal with in terms of why this particular genre needs to be digitized in such a huge corpus. Do you have any solutions? Oh no, I only have questions. <laughs> well, I only have questions. How are we supposed to do this? <laughs> I think the other thing that you asked, that first question, that we have these big, huge industrial projects, and what happens when TEI degrades and blows up? And I think the first part of that that I want to address is that the, these big, huge industrial projects, this is going across uh, with digital humanities a lot right now, this idea of theory and cultural criticism, and that we need to go back and take a look at these digital projects that we're creating for the theory of it. And there uh, are some people who are trying to come together to create a, a, uh, a collection. I just had a moment of thinking, is it too soon to say this? But we're trying to put together a collection of uh, digital textual editors talking about feminist theory. And has that been lost? And has feminist theory been relegated to simply to recovery projects of women's writing and then not done anymore? And so I think we're, we're at a, a turning point in digital humanities where we have to go back and start considering that. The literary annuals were brought forth as a recovery project in the 70s and 80s. And then people sort of left them alone thinking, we're done, we did it. We pointed towards them. We indicated them in some way in anthologies of women's literature. Somebody described them. So we no longer have to look at that material object. And by the way, we don't have access to it and nobody can really. People make claims about them without looking at all of them or looking at them across the way. So one of the issues that we start to have is, is how do we sell it? If these big industrial projects that are getting funding are of canonical authors. So how, and we haven't actually created or figured out how to create a great digital edition or archive of multiply authored texts. So how do we include the material object as well as these multiple authors? And you can see the, and engravings, I mean, and authors, I'm using wide and mostly engravings of paintings and editors and the prefaces. How, how do we do that with something that's so promiscuously complex? A different way to work for I think, I think, we, I think uh, we're pushing right now to be innovative uh, because that's where the grant funding is with the NEH uh, Office of Digital Humanities and they've created some really fantastic things. Uh, however, I was, I, and I know a lot of those people and work with them, but I'm standing over here with this project in my back pocket thinking it's never going to get done just because we don't have the labor. Unless I did classes, unless I ran a graduate class or an undergraduate class in which they become the worker bees. Yes. It's not the, optimal for the class. The, the apprentice scientist in the lab. Right. Do you presume you don't have a digital humanities program at your university? No. Because I mean that's that's the great thing about having one, you know, as we've just acquired one this year. 
that I totally take your point that you can't just expect students to just kind of digitise stuff when it's nothing to do with their programme. But the great thing about what you have from digital humanities students is you can. Because you can, you can give them work placement projects and say, right, okay, this is your job. You study digital humanities. You can either, you know, you do this either as part of your work placement or you do this as, you know, you, you do a, um, an individual study or a dissertation or something like that based around, around the stuff. So, um, and if, if you don't have any digital humanities actually physically in your university, are there any st sort of students, grad students of digital humanities that you could kind of crowdsource some stuff for? There are quite a few who are interested in working on the annuals and digitizing them and putting them into whatever format we eventually come up with. But we're talking it's about a handful of people. Mm -hmm. uh, again, it's an access issue. They don't know what's in there. It's, just the, it's the classic digital humanities thing that we all love in terms of uh, discovery. We don't know the questions that we want to ask until we get in there and then we create more questions. We don't know what we don't know yet. Mm -hmm. And that's the beauty of it, but there are students on a, on a deadline. I have, uh, I'm, a, I'm in a, an extremely traditional department, uh, and they are very generous colleagues, let me say, because uh, we're recording this. They let me um, run wild and teach all of my classes from a digital humanities perspective. And I could start running my 19th century British novel or my romantics class solely as a way to produce some digital project. And then, the, but then I would have to see them again for an honors course or something else to continue year after year. It would take about half the semester to teach them all the encoding and things like that. So there's no consistency with it. And I, and I have done it with other much smaller projects, one or two books that they've digitized. I have a, I have a group now that's working on digitizing some Beardsley work, and it was just because we happened to find it in the library, and the library didn't want to throw it away. It turns out it was a really rare book. So they gave it to me, and they didn't know it was rare, and I looked it up and wanted to run out of my office with it under my shirt. It's <laughs> mine! <laughs> so I, I got four students together and asked them to, if they wanted to work on it, and they said yes, and so we're doing it outside of the curriculum. Everything that I do works around my institution and the curriculum, uh, and I imagine there's a lot of people who are doing their own sort of off in the wild digital humanities and departments like mine, mm -hmm. and are never going to quite get together with doing those kinds of things. But there are, there are ways around it, and there are ways to teach students to do these kinds of things. And um, the University of San Francisco and San Francisco State are very interested in creating a digital humanities or digital studies consortium. And it's a matter of getting people together to talk to each other, because we have a lot of digital studies people on our campus. Yeah. Well, how, do you, how did you guys do it? Well, uh, we, yes, because we, were, we did this kind of thing. We were very different from CCH, which has obviously got a very long distinguished history. And, you know, CCH and Digital Humanities have kind of grown up together, whereas obviously when we started, not very long ago, um, we knew that we couldn't have a sort of centre such as CCH because we couldn't ask people to come to us. You know, we thought well, there would already be, as I say, a lot of people doing Digital Humanities. Um, we have this thing in UCL called Grand Challenges, which is it's a way of organising interdisciplinary research so that we work on big kind of societal questions and there are five grand challenges, it might be a sixth team, but um, so we've got a very kind of top-down mandate for doing interdisciplinary research. These are things like inter well, one of them is intercultural like interactions, as well which is um, sustainable cities, you know, these sorts of big questions, global health. Uh, so anyway, it worked within within this but because of the grand challenges we've had a Kind of tradition of having these things at people town meetings where um, you just kind of have an idea and you arrange a meeting and you see if anyone signs up for it, if you see what I mean. So you kind of come up with an interdisciplinary idea and you say, okay, anybody interested? Great. And in fact, Willard knows this very well. Willard was the inspiration for ours in the sense that our head of computer science as then was heard Willard giving a talk in Cambridge. And said, "Hey, this district mantis thing sounds great. Do we do that here?" <laughs> and I just so happened to be because I'm I'm equipped with associate dean for research in my faculty, and I just happened to be on the email um, with when the, when the, this guy emailed the dean and copied it to me. And I said, "Well, fine, enough, thanks. Well, that's exactly what I do." And but we don't. You know, there's a couple of us that do it, but we don't have anything organised. So at that point, we had one of these town meetings, 
and said, okay, you know, come along if you, if you think you're interested. And we got over 100 people from every faculty in the faculty by which we mean sort of, I don't know what you call them in America, but you know, sort of, like there's a faculty of arts and humanities in the world of, you know, engineering and those kind of things. Um, and yeah, we had someone from every single faculty, pretty much, I think. And that hasn't meant that everyone has stayed with the, the programme, but they, they kind of expressed interest. And it was from that point that the Vice Provost for Research came up to me before the meeting and said, what do you want to get out of this? And I thought about it, and I thought, I have no idea. I thought, that's not a good thing to say for Vice Provost for Research. So I said, I think we could establish a Centre for District Humanities. <laughs> he said, that sounds like a good idea. You come and see me. So I did, and we have this, again, a sort of discretionary fund that the Provost holds, which he, for which he could fund ideas that seemed to him to be interesting. And that's a sort of short-term funding thing. So we had two years of funding on the idea of it, it was a British concept. And, you know, could we prove that there was interest in history of humanities? And I very much said, you know, we'll have this sense, but it'll be very small, and it will be a part of a network. It will be connecting us to lots of other different people around UCL and outside UCL, you know, museums, galleries, libraries, all that kind of stuff. And that's how it happened. And we had this, and we started off the graduate program both the dean said, hey, you need, you need to have a, a teaching program as well. Um, you know, if you're doing all this good research, you can, you know, students need to have access to it too. So we did that, and um, they said if you can make it work, if people, you know, there seems to be enough interest in it, if it works, uh, you know, they get some students and that kind of stuff, well, we'll support it, and they have. So, you know, two years old, and they said, right, okay, fine, this seems to be working, you've got grad students, you've got PhD students, you've got lots of people who want to get interested in this stuff. And so they've just now said, well, you've proved the idea works. But I think that's, it's particular to our university because there are these, you know, big organisational things that try to encourage people to cross disciplines and work with people from other areas. And there is this discretionary funding pot. But I think that that model is being used by other places now. I think Australian National University has done something like this. Uh, Cambridge University is doing something very similar. It has a digital humanities network now. I think uh, there's another UK university doing it. I can't remember who. But I think, in a sense, where you've got what I call kind of second phase digital humanities, not first phase where you can sort of set up your own. It's in the second phase. You can't say, if you want to do digital humanities, you must come to us. You actually have to go to them and then make the connections. And so maybe that's the kind of model that could be used. It doesn't, I mean, it doesn't take that much funding to get it started. And, you know, we're sort of still, in a sense, proving ourselves. We're still very small compared to CCH. But it, it is the way that that kind of networking activity can work out. Because you find people all over the place that you've got absolutely no idea. I, mean, I didn't know really when we started up. And, and Uli's in the Department of Dutch, and I had no idea, despite the fact he's in my own faculty, <laughs> that he did digital humanities. And we found these connections all over the place. And the people kind of like, oh, yeah, well, I do that. And in those connections, you make all sorts of exciting discoveries, I think. So are there in, in the proof of concept, that final one is, it, are your administrators looking to see that there's interest, or are they looking to see that there's a product or an outcome or a publication or a project? Both. I mean, they're looking to see that there's interest, but they're also looking to see that there's proof of interest. So we've got, you know, our PhD student numbers have gone up massively, and, you know, we've got a good 22 students on the first cohort of the Masters. And, you know, so that provides a revenue stream. But, I mean, we haven't got any really big, we've got some small research projects, but we've only been going two years. And our next challenge is big research projects. And, you know, that's the next thing we're working to. And what they're, so what they're looking for is a kind of proof that there's interest and proof that there's, there is some kind of financial stuff, but also that, you know, we are kind of making, making progress. I mean, the other thing is that my, the dean of my faculty um, is someone who does digital humanities stuff too, to some extent. And he's a book scholar at Henry Woodhouse. But um, he has a project that's collaborative with CCH, um, Cell, and so he knew about digital humanities. So when I said, oh, there's the single digital humanities, he said, oh yeah, okay, great, I understand that. I think, you know, that seems good to me. 
And that's, again, it's, a, it's, it's something where if you're lucky and you have the right admin, senior admin people, then great. If they have to kind of get it. And if they get it, fine. If they don't, you know. I'm sure it must be a bit more challenging. My dean actually was on board with sending us to the project every but in the end, uh, he saw it as a, a network. That, and for him, that wasn't valuable. Mm -hmm. he, because we were teaching his two first mm -hmm. before anything else. Uh, and what ended up happening was that three years into it, we had to pull because we couldn't do it. We couldn't do We couldn't offer anything to them mm -hmm. other than our students. And that would be in like step two or three of what Bamboo was, was yeah. commissioning at that time. So we've created a game studies program instead. Mm -hmm. So there was this, we're, we're sort of all over the place. It's getting, the biggest problem is getting really people to talk to each other. There's an engineer who does digital humanities stuff, but he calls it something else. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a computational linguist. I've been there seven years, I've never heard of this. And this was somebody who was, uh, the lingu linguistics parted from English and comparative studies about 20 years ago in a bitter divorce. And so the two departments don't talk to each other. Um, but the computational linguist is doing some really fabulous things. So I've just started a dialogue and talking to him as well. But the, the whole idea also sounds like you went from the bottom up and got the interest first from people and that interest in and of itself. And, and um, it sounds like a really great strategy. We would have to enter into from the teaching aspect and the students asking for it, yeah. which they are now if they take my classes. They, they, they get it. Um, but but we still, you, you know, we're still having a problem with what it, what's valid to teach in the literature class and social yeah. networking and, and things like that. So we're still having those kinds of debates and just in our, our program in and of itself. Mm -hmm. So there's there's a struggle. i just if, if you can indulge me for just a, a second, I want to go back to um, Willard what you said earlier that the idea of building these things that we would do the scholarship later and I would offer to that that the building of it for me as a as a scholarly editor it ends up being part of the scholarship. Articulating that is in the preface, the decisions I made, and things like that. That's all textual editors do. But doing the bigger questions, asking, is this really true? Why does everybody pay attention only to the 1829 and 1828 keepsake? Because there's canonical authors in it. Because everybody has access to it. Because the publisher was really brilliant in, in shipping it and selling it everywhere you possibly could. So there's a lot of copies of it all through the United States libraries. Um, but for the building the forget-me-not archive also offered me the opportunity to open and close every single one of the books. You know, the, there's a big difference between you dreaming of a project and spending your time building it, which I agree is scholarship of a different kind. It's a scholarship involved in many things. And it's very valuable. But on these big industrial scale projects, there are scores of people who are doing what other people tell them to do. And that's not humanity scholarship anymore because you don't set your own agenda. So there is an inherent tension in these big projects, which is which is addressed in the model that Claire talked about, in which a student is the process in the process of his or her learning takes on this laboratory duty for a fixed amount of time and then goes out into the world and does other things. Yes, yes. But the, the, the big, the, the type of pool model, which some large scale projects have, have implemented, traps people in subservient roles. And a lot of people have been trapped because of the lack of jobs, um, particularly because of the tenure system in North America. The, the, the tenure wall has, has relegated a whole generation of, of proto scholars to these subsidiary roles that they then went off and you know they got married and had babies and done all this other sort of stuff uh, that has then fixed them in this subsidiary role. So there is there is a problem to think about, a social problem to think about that. Also about I mean there's selling and persuasion and setting things up. Historically, there's a big, big difference between the UK and North America in the way in which um, new things can be established. Historically, in the UK, it's relatively easy to set up a new thing, so long as you can demonstrate that there's an audience for it, i.e. money coming in in some way or other. Whereas in North America, the, the tenure system 
makes it extremely difficult to set up anything new on academic footing. As long as you're dealing with, with quasi-academic and paradigmatic things, that's fine, except they're extremely vulnerable to changes in fashion and to dippings in budgets. As long as something isn't planted in the, the root of the institution or what the institution says it is for, then it's extremely vulnerable. I, I agree with all of what you said. And my only response to that is uh, if you take on in, in North America, in the ten, just in the United States actually, the tenure promotion stuff has really gotten to such a heated and heinous level about what you're supposed to produce. And, and the call for having things in dual platforms, print and digital. Print in order to assuage a certain set over here and then digital over here uh, in order to feel like you making some sort of contributions. I'm not sure of a way to get around that um, because I was a product of this system and made a choice when I finished my dissertation to only publish in open access journals, which means online. And, uh, and took a great risk, was really punished for it last year in the tenure battle I had in my department, but got through and now can turn around and start to help other people. I'm not sure how much digital humanities, I'm going to get scared for this, how much digital humanities is responsible for saving and altering all of these things? Who's going to be the first one to make a change in the way that we do it? And who's going to make it stick? The MLA is trying really hard to do it. Yeah. And there's, but at the same time, at the pre-conference -con, pre workshop for DH Answers, Every one of us on the panel said, go out and get sit on and be an apprentice and go do a digital project and see what it's like and see if you really want to do it and see what the work of it is and, and if you really want to engage at that level because you'll always have to do that. So we might be sending a mixed message in digital humanities. It's really cool. It's a lot of fun. It's progressive. It, you can ask big questions of, uh, of things that you probably couldn't ask before, but how do we... How do we get around that, that social problem, the apprentice problem, the doing double work issue, doing the both digital and the print? Do you do a digital article and then you have to go off and find a print journal that's still publishing? When the, when the linguists in Toronto write in my PhD, we wanted to set up a linguistics department. The English department stomped on the idea regularly because they did. They said, we do language, so we don't need linguistics. They got together and brought in all of the top level linguists they could think of, including Chomsky, to give lectures on linguistics and establish the fact through that that it was real. But there were all these other institutions where it was going on, and out of, I don't, I wasn't there at the time, but I, I was told, out of embarrassment, the institution gave in. Because it had been established that it was real, other people were doing it. That is one strategy that is now available to you because there are enough places that are in Canada and in the UK and just now in Australia that are establishing academic positions in the field. There's another side to that as well, I think, in the, especially in our own English departments as well, so I can identify with some of these issues. Um, but there's a way of making the case for this side of work uh, in a way that does speak to traditional we think of traditional literary scholarship. I mean, um, the, the book history act has been, been very, very useful. It's book history before its sort of slightly uh, 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 threatened position on Marge's literary departments. It's, it's really kind of embraced and rejuvenated in some ways by our digital work. And you can make very good arguments in those terms um, using digital tools. You can also do the sort of work you have with sort of accounting does pay off sometimes. But in terms of teaching, um, students read digital texts at the time, and it's very hard to teach. Well, it seems it seems false or somehow insubstantial to teach um, literary theory or, um, or textual scholarship or, or analyses of literature or, or with, without paying any attention to that. Um, and so English departments that don't take the digital seriously aren't paying attention to where text is today. Um, and, and that seems an untenable position going into the future. Mm. Um, and it's intellectual as well, it's an intellectual argument. Which sits outside the institutions. And also 
there is, I mean, in the UK, it's, it's potentially different because the research excellence framework, which is the thing that we have every few years that assesses the quality of our research, is now accepting digital submissions to every single subject panel. So that the argument that says to young scholars, it is it is a waste of time to do digital scholarship is no longer tenable. Because you can say, you can submit to the REF in any format you like. And that basically means that you know, senior scholars can no longer say, don't waste your time doing this digital project, because you've got to write publications about it, and that's the only thing that counts, not anymore. Yeah. And I think that's hugely important, because, OK, this is only the UK's thing, but the REF and the RAE that preceded it had huge implications globally in terms of research and, and the implications of research. And I think if it can be proven, I mean, people are still very nervous about it. You know, people are still kind of going, should I do that, should I do that, should I do that, should I maybe just write an article instead? But, you know, one or two people in my institution are thinking, well, maybe, maybe, maybe I'll do that, maybe I'll put in my digital project. And I think that that, and actually one of them is a very senior scholar. And if that person puts their input in, that would be very good field indeed. So I think there is that injury wedge coming in. I know tenure is a different thing, but the ref is in some way, it's sort of like, like a kind of road with tenure, it's like everybody has to do it every six years or seven, or seven years or something like that. And I think that's the beginning, that's the beginning of saying, you know, what the, what the ref is basically saying is we don't care as long as it conforms to the definition of research. That, you know, if it is being produced on the basis of activity that can be called research, we don't care if you paint it on somebody's wall. You know, which some of our people at the same time will do. Um, and, and therefore, you know, it's I, I think that that is terrifically helpful because I think for a long time these kind of problems have obtained, and that you you know people have said, oh, well, you know, you can't get tenure, and you can't get promoted, and you can't get a full professorship. And I have a full professorship, and I've never written one of and I don't intend to. So, you know, that, it, it can be done. It's like Unsworth was the first one to get, a, get tenure without knowledge of. And so it, it, it happens, and I think we have to kind of believe that it, it will gradually, you know, gradually happen. But I know it's not easy for what I'm saying, well, this is great for us, I get it, you know, and it's not easy for people, you know, such as yourself. But I think, I think there is a bit of hope to suggest that it may be changing. I, th I definitely think that there is a hope, and I think things are also changing. Uh, and unfortunately, something that was said at, at, at one of the panels at the MLA convention was that when Harvard starts doing this, everybody will start doing it. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm in an institution where we are, our mandate is teaching. So, but they still have the same ideas. When Harvard starts doing open access, we'll start doing it. When they start accepting digital projects, we'll start doing it as well. And, but the dean is completely behind the digital project. And, and, but he's also asked that, and I have to say, as a scholarly editor too, without even the digital, that's still on the margins in the US doing that kind of work. Mm -hmm. That is, in, unless you're at a, a, a school or a department where they understand what it is to do editorial work, they think it's just getting people's work in and then editing it. This whole idea of transcribing and making decisions to do it. We still have, we still have some PR to do in scholarly editing. I mean, Society for Textual Scholarship is kind of dwindling in terms of its membership. That's our big one. Um, Sharp with the book history is growing because we're pulling in the digital aspect of it. We the public the Bibliographic Society of America. It's kind of a mix. It's people who are not in academia and, and ones who are staunch bibliographers. Jerry McGinn complains about this and talks about a serious insanity here. Which all one? The, time. The, the denigration of editorial practice so, is not scholarship. Yes. It is a very serious problem. Yes. This is another thing that's really easy to demonstrate to students, isn't it? There's no kind of small scale class activity. You just go, here's a text, encode it. It doesn't matter what your HTML is or whatever. Yeah. That, that's that's it to really work. And it's really easy to go, well, you know, what, what, what's your encoding there? What choices you make? What difference does that make? And where's the beef question? And it's very easy to achieve very quickly. Um, and by building that into what students are learning, it's easier then to kind of yeah. store the kind of, you know, take a suit to Right, right. And, 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 it's happened, and when my institution is relatively 
free at the upper levels in terms of the kind of work you want to do and whatever gets the students involved and engaged. It's, uh, it's a matter of convincing our English department that these kinds of things are very engaging and good for the students to do and to work on. Um, and, and also giving students 19th century texts to hold and play with. I always bring in my collection of uh, the boys' own annuals from the late 19th century, and it's all about how boys should go out and kill the natives. <laughs> just, it's just racist and um, salacious and promiscuous, and they all, they love reading it. It's how to build a boat and then sail to Africa. <laughs> and then there's an engraving of, you know, pear soap all over the place. And, and they just eat it up, but we only do a day on it in my, his, my literary theory class, and I'm thinking that maybe we should do without telling my administration that my whole curriculum for that class should just be all TEI encoding or, or whatever encoding and, and taking a look at the advertisements in household words. Um, uh, our, I, I, our library now owns a collection of um, blue books from Dickens' Hard Times. And it was because I could no longer justify having them in my collection, so I sold it to my triathlon partner um, for uh, a mere pittance of what it was worth. And now we have that in our special collections and our students can go and create a digital edition of it. And I don't have to explain that to any, any, anybody as long as it's happening in the classroom and it conforms to our program review. Uh, and we can start off that way. I'm all, I, I have tenure now, so uh, there's a little bit, I've always done what I did. I've never apologized for it. I just went ahead and did it. But that's probably why I ran into problems at the department level with tenure. And there were some valid um, uh, assessments of what I was doing, and then there were not some not so valid assessments of what it is that I was doing in terms of all of my scholarship. But there was one in, um, in the review from the department level that said that I privileged form over content in terms of my teaching and in terms of my scholarship. And uh, in the English department, yeah, they 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 talked about form of content as being separate. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, you know, David Green was my dissertation chair, and when this all was going on, I sent him all of the documents, and he, he's, I'm the anonymous case he writes about in debates in digital humanities about tenure review, and he cites some of it, uh, and what it is that, that uh, was going on at a particular time. But I think it, it mirrors what goes on in general in terms of academia and, and valuing. And, and also that constant question I get about the literary end is what's the value of the things that are going on? Uh, and we, th this was written about before, but I think we spend so much time also offering up why things are valuable, and everything I do is on the fringes. And I think I chose that on purpose because I like to do those kinds of things. But now I'm tired of explaining it. Now I want to get to the scholarship. Now I want to do things like looking at all the Gothic short stories and, and these annuals and, and assessing them. And I'm tired of explaining over and over again why we should be studying these things. And I have actually heard two things. People are telling their, uh, their graduate students not to study the literary annuals because it won't get them a job. Um, they're also, I've also- They're not going to get a job anyways. I know. <laughs> I know, but there's always hope my graduate students. <laughs> Don't say that. You're going to get a job. Some job. The, the other thing that I heard from our own people and our own bibliography, book history, textual studies people, for a dissertation or for a book, don't do a scholarly edition. It won't get you credit. Which was really interesting that it was our own people doing it. And so we're propagating some of these things, but we're asking these graduate students to take a risk to do these things, but then we're pulling back from them and saying, you know, you might not give you a job. Right? So my, my response to those kinds of thing is, those things, and this Kathleen Fitzpatrick has said this everywhere, if you go out and encourage graduate students to do this stuff, you have to have done it first, number one, and mentor them through it, and tell them where they're gonna hit the hiccups and help them write the reviews to, to help to change the tone and the attitude or whatever else it is but also um, be there for them when they actually want to do it. I would love to see one of my, we have a master's level group when I work with PhD students, and I would love to see one of them do a scholarly edition uh, as a master's thesis. I, I think that would be really incredible. We have a lot of legalists uh, on the faculty who are really good at doing scholarly editions, and I think that if one of them produced it, I think they would go far in our research competition that we have all over the 
Cal State campuses and things like that because they would be offering new information for people. Forget about just doing the digital part of it. Just do a scholarly edition and see what that's like. Can you say a little bit more about what you mean as utterly charming phrase, <laughs> subtle vocabulary? We, there was a, there's a whole conversation that's still raging through digital humanities um, by scholarly editors that we can't start crowdsourcing these kinds of editions that will just invite everybody in for peer review and comments and that it won't be authorized. And it happened at the Digital Humanities Conference last year where the, the, um, some of the postdocs who were working with racing at the University of Victoria stood up and said, this is, a, this is a great new idea, why don't we do a dynamic edition, here's the prototype. And the, the digital scholarly editors in the room had the most problem with crowdsourcing the information. So at the in March, uh, we did a pre-conference workshop for Society for Textual Scholarship in which we talked about digital editions. And Martha Nell Smith has said this before, and Lisa Gittleman said this as well, and I've offered up, that we need supple um, rhetorics for describing digital editions. And instead of calling them editions or, or scholarly editions, we need to be able to have a vocabulary that transcends the theory of it. And the debate came out of whether people, amateurs, I mean, that was the dialogue that developed this bifurcation of amateurs versus um, professionals, us in this room, we're the professionals. Any Yahoo out on the internet is an, is an amateur. So Lisa Gettleman suggested that we go back to the old idea of amateur and start thinking about people who are passionate or interested being able to add information to all of these digital editions and opening it's beyond peer review. We're just talking about crowdsourcing information in a very public way. Public scholarship. This is what the humanities is calling for in the U.S. right now. Tell us your value. Give us your public scholarship. So that's where the supple vocabulary comes mm -hmm. from. It's not from me. It's from Lisa and Martha Nell Smith. It's enormously important because we lack the vocabulary to talk about what we're doing properly. Well, we get, we're borrowing still from old or Former, how do I say this without being derogatory? The well, classic, no, <laughs> old humanities. So we're borrowing these ideas about scholarly editions from the ways that it used to be done in print, and then it sort of exploded when it became digital. But do you think we understand properly the way it was done in print? We, we as an up and coming people, or uh, how many people we, actually go to a scholarly, traditional scholarly edition? and examine it in detail as to how it works. I don't, I think they just use it. Almost no one. I think they use it as a consumer. A lot of hand waving. Oh, I'm going to make a digital edition. They often make a digital edition without ever actually coming to terms with how a, a really nice, a really good traditional scholarly edition works. It's an enormously complex creation. Right, well, I think that's and why we went through all the derivations of it. It's a hypermedia, right. it's an archive, it's an edition, it's a, it's, it's whatever else, it's a collection, it's an arsenal. I don't think we've settled on that. Uh, he said that, he wrote that tongue in cheek. Yeah. I, I, I didn't where that comes from, I really love that. Like, it, well, like, he wrote it for a, a DHQ piece that Amy Earhart and Mara Ives um, okay. had collected. It's, it's, it's Hausman originally. Yeah. Is it? A. E. Hausman. Yeah. About the yeah. uh, uh, um, an arsenal of, uh, I forget. The phrase David Downs spoke it wonderfully, yeah. but it, it's it's very traditional. I think we should I think we should immediately appropriate this term. I think it's ideal. Especially as we're in London. Some people will be asking for digital spurs. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I think yeah, the crux of this article is that we, we need to get beyond the, the nomenclature and. Mm -hmm. um, figure out as we go along. We need exciting. to make everyone write a philological introduction to every article. <laughs> <laughs> we don't do philology things. anymore, though. Nobody, nobody really studies Take it. Take apart the words. I mean, think about the vocabulary mm -hmm. and, and try to wrestle with that, that difficulty of not having a word for something. Mm -hmm. um, which doesn't mean coining things so much. I mean, it means being really attentive to the way in which you write. Well, that's what we tried to accomplish with that STS con uh, workshop. Mm -hmm. And in the end, we didn't end up with anything other than more questions again, which I think was fruitful. 
but it left most of the people in the room, ranging from senior scholars to graduate students who were really hungry for this very traditional view of scholarly editing, with this idea that they had a whole lot to read and didn't know where they were going to end up afterwards, mm -hmm. what their ideas were going to be. And that was scary for the graduate students. Senior colleagues, it was, I think it was <laughs> this again, <laughs> we recycle things every 20 years or so, same things coming up. Uh, so I, I think that but there's, but it's also exciting, there's room to grow and to call it something else. Call it something else that our other non-digital humanities colleagues will also understand. It doesn't need to be just, mm -hmm. I think I have to justify Arsenal a lot to my, to my colleagues in my home department. They might take offense to that, actually. <laughs> yeah, they might think you belong to a certain stratum of, of American society. That Uh, 
I this is a tool for opening up the eye, opening up the eye, the little books. It's a, it's it's a kind of. It, it can stand on its own for people who don't have, have access to them. You can't just reach over and pull them off the shelf. But I use it, especially in the writing that I'm doing, looking at something rather than going and pulling the book. Mm -hmm. For instance, if I want to see the table of contents um, or, or how many other things this publisher or, or this editor put together, then I'll go to the tables that I've created in the archive itself because then I can see it very quickly. But if I want to actually look at an engraving, I'll look at it online first and then go get it and then take out my magnifying glass and a really bright light and see if I can actually figure out what's going on in that particular engraving or something. So it's an access point for me, but that's unique because I own the collection myself and never want to give it away. Right? But the, I think that I don't have anybody to talk to. I have six people, I mean not in my life in general, people. <laughs> we just, um, the, I am on sabbatical and the cat refuses to talk to me, so I'm left at home writing by myself quietly for a long time. But the, 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 what happens is that I have a dozen people who I can really talk to about literary angles. And uh, if I can engage more graduate students in this work, then I can also help them with building whatever it is they want to do with it, whether it's digital or whatever you want to criticism of it. So this is self-serving by building the Forget Me Not Archive that I'm pulling more people in who are more interested in writing more about it in, um, in, in, a, in a way that's not, that's, um, that's not making too many generalizations about the genre in and of itself. Because I did it in order to rectify some of the things that were being said about literary annuals from all perspectives. So I imagine if, um, I know I've enticed a few graduate students to start collecting them. But that doesn't mean that they can make assessments about all of them. But I think my position is unique. When, when I give or sell whatever the collection, wherever it's going, uh, I, I would like to be, I would like attached to it that it needs to be digitized in order to entice people to come and look at the book itself. Because I'm, I'm still a bibliophile, even though I do all the digital stuff. I can, I can never, you can, you can never replace the feeling of the silk covers sitting next to the paper boards and how stark a contrast that is and how the difference in just the, the publication process is so visceral and visible right in front of you in, in comparison, or the stains that are on the front of the keepsake silk boards and how they got there. One's a thumbprint. And I think, why have That's that another there? hardcore activity to force your graduate students to do, I would is take a book and decide what you're going to digitize, and in the process realize how much is being lost. I think my, I have a, a cut, some students doing that at the Beardsley Project, and mm -hmm. they spent last semester researching and passing the books around, and it's just four of them, and this semester I said the goal is to create a digital scholarly edition, and they're having problems. They said, can't we digitize it all? Yeah, and it's their slim bond. Yeah, what do you mean all? <laughs> they want every page, and they want to be able to break out into other things, and they want to be able to keep it everything. Yeah. It's that uh, there were page, there were uncut pages in them, and we were writing about it, and, and it was a poem. It's called Battle of the Barber, um, and they had to read those two pages, so I cut the pages, and I thought they were going to have a hard time. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a story to tell you later. <laughs> I did it slowly in order to draw yeah. that a little more. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Hoping that I wouldn't like veer off to the side or anything like that. But they, so they have that sort of, they have two things. They became their blue files from it, but they also have that archive fever. They can't yeah. stop researching the author and the artists. And they, all the way back to, I started asking questions. Well, who is the publisher? Why is this number 45 or 62? Why were these weird, why were these four books put together and, and put into the library bin? Nobody wanted them? Didn't anybody know that they were valuable? Well, and what, there was a Blake book there, and I said, let's not pay attention to Blake right now. Um, I think it's illustrating Grace's book. Because there's been so much done on it, and it wasn't a text that was valuable enough. And, and um, I, I intimated that but didn't tell them to do it. They said after a while, we now, they figured out why the Blake was in the pile of the books and what could have brought them all together because they were artist books and had these beautiful, magnificent engravings. Um, and they said, well, we don't really want to do Blake. We found a lot on him and we don't think that we can contribute.
contribute anything to it. And by the way, we don't want to read through all that scholarship. We just want to do Beardsley. I said, okay, it's your project. Since it's not for a grade, they can do whatever they want. But that's just four students and handling that. And four students who I cook for once a month, and they come to my apartments, and we sit around for two and a half hours talking. In fact, I have to kick them out. They're the lucky students. But it's it, it's for it's a fifth course for me and it's a fifth or sixth course for them that they're not mm -hmm. nobody's getting credit for. So I'd love to be able to run that as a class, but I'd have thirty students. How do I do that? Mm -hmm. oh, I'm not comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully, like red wine, braised glitters, and stuff like that. <laughs> but I'd like to I'd like to be able to do that, and I think that's I've made my career not being this person who does the animals or the digital scholarly editing, but is doing digital pedagogy. I'm the one who's been screaming at digital humanists about pedagogy and pay attention to, really pay attention to me because I'm over at a Cal State school and we have no money and please come play with me. That's basically what it's been. But it's contingent on where I got hired and what I'm doing and what the dean wanted me to do. Well, that, that's it. I mean, all the talk about models of digital humanity centers and ways people got started are, are all so anecdotal and locally constrained by conditions at the time things got started, by the personalities who happened to be there, that there's only a limited degree that you learn from what anybody will tell you about how they did it. And there's also there's so many different funding structures to go along mm -hmm. with it as well. Mm -hmm. Right. Yes. That's all to say, can I come work over here? Here at University of Victoria. Let's see what some people take me. Yeah, you can work here. You can work here. <laughs> We'll, we'll, have a, we'll have a job coming up soon. <laughs> I'll take an affiliation. I still like California. It's sunshine. It's, this is our winter right here. <laughs> All year round. Uh, thank you very much for.